the Leon Panetta 2019 Lecture Series. Checks and Balances, Will Our Democracy Survive? This lecture discusses the role of nationalism, globalism, and patriotism. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sylvia Panetta. What a wonderful full house, and how good it is to see all of you. Good evening, and welcome to the third event in the 2019 Leon Panetta Lecture Series. This season, our 22nd year, we've been discussing the system of checks and balances and considering the future of our democracy. At our first event, we discussed the Mueller investigation. Though the investigation is now concluded, there remain significant questions about how the results of the special counsel's report will be shared with the American public. And more importantly, how we can protect our system of elections from further interference. Last month, we turned our focus to the press and their responsibility to bring the truth to the American people and the Congress as a check and balance on the executive branch. Tonight, we turn our focus to foreign affairs. For the 70 years that followed World War II, America has without question been the leader of the free world. In that leadership role, we have worked closely with our allies in pursuit of economic stability, peace, and the support of the values of Western democracy. That leadership and alliances won the Cold War and spread global prosperity. But globalization has had destabilizing effects. Nationalism, nationalism and populism have surged. The result of inequality within countries, the dislocation associated with the 2008 financial crisis, job losses caused by trade and technology, increased the flow of migrants and refugees, and the power of social media to spread hate. President Trump speaks of America first and has withdrawn, from, has withdrawn from treaties and agreements to protect what he sees as the best interests of the United States. But the reality is that if the United States fail to win, to lead, no one else will. From Iran to the Middle East, to Venezuela, to North Korea, China, and Russia, the globe is covered in a number of flashpoints that could set off at any minute. Added to these concerns are issues like terrorism, the threat of cyber, climate change, and trade. Can President Trump protect American economic, political, and military security without working collaboratively with our allies? Is he right to question the long-standing liberal global order or will his actions leave our nation vulnerable and without the support of long-held alliances? And does he have the necessary advice and counsel required to make these vital decisions? Tonight, we'll talk with three experts who know firsthand how volat volatile and how dangerous the world can be. All three are men with whom Leon worked closely during his work at the CIA and the Department of Defense. They are well versed in our military capabilities, our diplomatic options, the threats we face, and the unique global leadership role assumed by this president. Our first guest is a retired four-star general and a 45-year Marine veteran who has served and sacrificed on behalf of the interests of the United States from the battlefields of Iraq to the Oval Office. As part of a celebrated military career, he led the multinational force West in Iraq and was later the senior military aide to Defense Secretaries Robert Gates and Leon Panetta. In 2016, he assumed leadership of the United States Southern Command. 
He was responsible for Guantanamo Bay and all United States military operations in South and Central America, and he focused on border security and regional stability in nations like Venezuela. He worked closely with the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, and the Drug Enforcement Administration. After less than a year in retirement, he assumed the post of Secretary of Homeland Security and worked on immigration and border security issues. He went on to serve as Chief of Staff for President Donald Trump from July 31, 2017 to January 2, 2019, and made an effort to impose discipline on White House operations. So <laughs> please welcome General John Kelly. Our second guest has 27 years of diplomatic service, has served under Democratic and Republican presidents, and is considered one of the most distinguished career diplomats of our time. He began his diplomatic service in 1980, working as an intern at the American Embassy in Mauritania. From 1983 to 1985, he was stationed at the American Embassy in Egypt. He went on to work at the American Consulate General in Jerusalem and later served on the National Security Council in the administrations of President George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton. During his work on the NSC, he was director for Soviet affairs, director for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia affairs, and special assistant to President Clinton. In 1995, he was named spokesperson for the U.S. Department of State and was later appointed ambassador to Greece. He served in that post for four years before being named ambassador to NATO. Promoted to Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs in 2005, he led negotiations on a number of key agreements on nuclear dis disarmament and was the lead United States negotiator on Iran's nuclear program. So please welcome Ambassador Nick Burns. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Our third guest is a recognized national authority on United States national security who has achieved political, advised political leaders on both sides of the aisle, including Presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama. During his time in the military, he commanded special operations forces at every level, eventually taking charge of the United States Special Operations Command. His career included combat during Desert Storm and both the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. He served as the Director for Strategic Planning in the Office of Combating Terrorism on the National Security Council staff. He was Commander of United States Special Operations Command, Staff of the Chief of Naval Operations, and the Chief of Staff at Naval Special Warfare Group 1. He commanded the troops that captured Saddam Hussein, and he also rescued Captain Phillips. He worked closely with Leon when Leon was CIA director on the successful 2011 operation in Abbottabad, Pakistan, that brought Osama bin Laden to justice. Please welcome Admiral William McRaven. Moderating our discussion is the man who created this lecture series, the former congressman for this district, director of the Office of Management and Budget. I love reading this. White House Chief, <laughs> White House Chief of Staff, director of the CIA, and secretary of defense. He's worked closely with, with each of these men in the effort to protect our nation at home and abroad. So please welcome Leon Panetta.
Good evening and welcome to this, our third forum of the Panetta Lecture Series. Our theme is checks and balances, uh, will our democracy survive? And as you know, we've uh, talked about the rule of law in the presidency. We've talked about the role of uh, free press and the role of the Congress. And tonight, we wanted to focus on the president's role as commander in chief and the institutions in our democracy that are intended to check the commander in chief, but also to work with the president in protecting our national security. President Ronald Reagan, at the 40th anniversary of the landing at Normandy, defined the role for United States leadership in the world. And there was a quote in his speech that I share with you. It said that the United States never was and never will be an isolationist country. Today, some 35 years after that speech, there's concern about whether or not the United States is withdrawing from its leadership role in the world. Is the old world order over? Are we seeing a major shift in power with China replacing the United States in that position in the 21st century? What are the implications of what's happening today for our role in national security? Those are the issues we'll discuss with this outstanding panel of speakers. All of them, uh, this is a little bit like old home week. I, I work with each of them. Uh, John Kelly was my aide at uh, the Department of Defense, uh, and uh, he was a tough Marine then, and I, I actually trained him for the position of being chief of staff. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Nick Burns uh, worked uh, at the uh, State Department when I was in the Clinton administration, worked very closely with him. Uh, he has always been a tremendous expert in diplomacy. Uh, and uh, of course, that guy on the end, uh, Bill McRaven, uh, was the uh, leader on special forces uh, that uh, I worked with uh, on the raid in, on bin Laden's compound. And he deserves a tremendous amount of uh, responsibility for that leadership. All right, let me, let me begin by uh, just asking a general question here about uh, foreign policy and uh, national security policy. Uh, you know, for over 70 years since World War II, the United States has been a leader in the world. Uh, We've built alliances. We've had agreements uh, on trade. Uh, we've had agreements on arms control. We've worked with international organizations. We have fought alongside our allies, uh, particularly after 9-11. The president has questioned some of these principles. But at the same time, he's also uh, implemented some of the same policies in the sense of sanctions. Uh, on, uh, on the Russians and others. Uh, he's tried to pursue uh, diplomacy, particularly with North Korea. He's also uh, tried to pull together uh, our forces with regards to fighting uh, ISIS and terrorism. So there are some uh, similar uh, policies that are being put into place. So uh, my question is, what is the foreign policy of the United States today under the Trump administration? Is it America first and the isolationism of the 1930s? Is it totally ad hoc based on whatever his guts tell him uh, you know, this country ought to stand for from crisis to crisis? Or is it a combination of both? A lot of tough talk about change, but at the same time implementing some of the same policies we've seen in the past. What is the foreign policy of this administration, John? Well, I'd start by saying, Mr. Secretary, that it is an American first foreign policy. That does not mean, though, 
uh, and the president's been fairly clear about this, I think, it doesn't mean to the detriment of everybody else. Uh, you know, he came certainly from a, from a different world in terms of not being a politician, not being a Washington guy. Uh, and when he came in, the two, probably the two driving things is he, is he is bound and determined to set the relationship back on what he would consider to be a more fair uh, footing. So in the case of uh, economics, trade, you know, we have these tremendous trade uh, uh, imbalances with countries like J uh, well, Japan and South Korea and the EU uh, and certainly China, uh, and he wants to fix that. He wants to fix the uh, NAFTA agreement with Mexico, and they, they, they've actually come up with a, with a uh, the, the, the team came up with a, a pretty good USMCA, uh, as it's called, agreement that, uh, you know, both, both uh, countries will have to adopt. Uh, but it's not necessarily to the detriment of Mexico, it's just in Canada, it's just a better, uh, fairer relationship. In terms of national security, uh, you know, he looks at NATO, and you know, at the end of the day, we, we uh, alongside our NATO allies, have for 70 years or so defended, uh, deterred any action by the old Soviet Union, now Russia. Uh, and as I would say many, many times in, in my dealings with, uh, with the team at the White House, that deterrence is better than fighting a war any day of the week. And, and yes, deterrence can be expensive, but it's still better than fighting a war. But as he looked at uh, NATO and the commitments that all NATO countries have made to spend 2% of their GDP as a kind of a target for what they should be send, spending on, uh, on their military defense, uh, very few of them have come even close to that. Uh, where the United States spends about 4% of GDP on, on its commitment to NATO. So he's been pretty vocal about, hey, boys and girls, uh, you know, start to work very, and it's been effective. I mean, the first year he, he was the president, I think uh, uh, purchases went up immediately to the tune of about 100 billion, that's continued. Some of the countries have come in and said, we'll get there, but it'll take us some time. Uh, but he's put pressure on them. The other issue, of course, we're in South Korea. Um, we spend a great deal of our own money defending South Korea, and we have a trade imbalance with South Korea, and he wants to fix that. So I, it's, it's not ad hoc. Uh, I mean, the two driving principles are, fair, the one driving principle for sure is fairness, both in the trade uh, area and in the, uh, and in the uh, military defense area. Nick? Well, I think we're now more than two years into the Trump presidency. I don't think it's fair to say that there's a Trump doctrine or a really coherent strategy of what he's trying to achieve. He appears to be very passionate, but John would know General Kelly much better about both trade and immigration. I've been a critic, um, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's it had to be responsible and say he's done some things well. I think his inclination um, that you've got to have good head, to, head of government relations with the other powers, with President Xi Jinping of China, uh, with President Putin of Russia, not, maybe not good relations, but at least an open channel, that's correct. I think he was correct about North Korea. Uh, a lot of people criticized him for going off to meet Kim Jong-un, but you know, the only American who had met Kim Jong-un before President Trump was a really good basketball player named, named Dennis Rodman, <laughs> but probably not the guy you want to negotiate the nuclear weapons future of the world. And, um, and the president looked at people like me and said, well, you guys had your chance in the Bill Clinton and George W. Bush administration. You'd failed because you did it kind of the bottom up. You didn't get to negotiate with the top leader. This is a dictatorship. Kim Jong-un runs everything. So I thought the president's inclination, let me go meet him, let me take his measure, let me see if he's serious, it made sense to me. Uh, that's good. I think he's been very tough on China, trade, and he needs to be. Particularly here, and I'm probably preaching to the choir in California, a lot of the intellectual property of California's best companies has been ripped off by the Chinese illegally under the World Trade Organization. So the president's made that a point and I've supported it. Um, all that praise aside, I worry that we are in retreat from our global leadership position uh, in three respects. Number one, NATO and, and the uh, alliances that we have. Uh, he's been an uncertain leader at best. He's failed to honor Article 5. He's not stood up to President Putin on the issue of Russian interference in our elections. We can contain the Russians in a conventional sense, military sense, but now they're using hybrid means to try to weaken us from within to disrupt our elections, to invade social media, to confuse us, and has, in my judgment, not been appropriate leadership by the president to deal with that. Number two, I'm a free trader. 
And what made us really great as an economic power in California, again, Massachusetts, where I come from, we're export states. We, are, we became great economies because we had the self-confidence to engage in free trade agreements. And we had, when the president came in, the opportunity for a trans-Pacific partnership, 40% of global GDP. It would have united the democratic countries of this part of the world, the Pacific, against China. And the president gave that up. He had the opportunity of a US-EU trade agreement. That's uh, 900 million people. The two largest economies on Earth, the EU and the United States, gave that up. So I worry he's dismantling the trade system. And finally, I'd say, if you go to Europe these days, the biggest challenge is this existential challenge of anti-democratic far-right populists like Marine Le Pen in France, trying to subvert democracies. And again, uh, the president has not embraced the small d Democrats like Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron, Theresa May, but uh, people in his administration have embraced Viktor Orban, the Polish government, some of these far right people who I think are not, they're not with us and they don't believe what we believe. So in my judgment, uh, this has been a weak performance, but I do wanna say in saying that, I'm sitting next to someone who I considered an American hero, someone who served his country loyally, and so no reflection on the individuals, I would just leave this at the president's doorstep. Bill, what do you think? Yeah, well, you know, national security is hard. And as we talked earlier today, uh, when I was on the National Security Council staff as a young Navy captain, I had a chance to, to see how we built the national security strategy and the national strategy for combating terrorism. And on paper, it looked very good, but implementing strategies is hard. And I think what you find in every president's tenure is at some point in time, there is going to be a crisis. And that's when you really find out whether or not the process that the president has put in place, the national security process, works. And in order for it to work, you have to have the right people in place, you have to trust those advisors, you have to have a deep bench. And yet when you take a look at the fact that we don't have a Secretary of Defense right now, uh, we, are, we are cutting the State Department, and you look at some of the key elements of our foreign policy and what we rely on, the intelligence community, the law enforcement community, uh, I think we have to make sure that those processes and those and the right people are in place to advise the president at a point in time when we're going to hit that crisis. Uh, as you know, there is a process whereby uh, every president gets briefed, starts at kind of the one star, or the deputy assistant secretary of defense or, or, or state when they look at an issue and they bring in uh, the, the resident experts, the, the foreign service officers, they bring in the great intel community officers. They begin to develop options for the president. They take that from the, the uh, planning committees up to the deputies committees, up to the principals committees, and then finally up to the National Security Council. And I know that President Trump does this, but you have to do it frequently enough and you have to make sure the bench is deep enough so that again, when you hit that crisis, everybody is in place and ready to move and, and able to provide the president the very best uh, options available to him. We haven't had that crisis yet. Um, so I would just encourage the president to get the right people in place as soon as possible and make sure his bench is deep uh, so that when that time comes, because it will come, uh, he's ready to, to deal with it. Uh, Nick, let's uh, pick up an issue that uh, Bill raised, which is uh, you know, what's happened with the State Department. I mean, I, I think it was uh, Jim Mattis who, who was said, if, if you don't fund the State Department fully, then I need to buy more ammunition, uh, which basically means that uh, you know, a strong military needs the support of a strong diplomacy uh, as well if we're gonna be strong. Uh, we've seen the State Department lose about 60% of their career ambassadors. Uh, today, we still have uh, over a third of the ambassadorships are unfulfilled. Uh, and in addition, uh, the administration called for a 20% cut uh, at the State Department. Uh, what's happening at the State Department now based on your own experience? And, what needs to be done to uh, repair the damage? Mr. Secretary, I'd say that what we needed, for, for us to succeed as a country, we need a strong military, we need strong intelligence services, strong diplomacy in the State Department, and we need good leadership. And when we have that, we're unbeatable. We are the best country in the world, we're the strongest country in the world. Can't neglect the State Department. And your figures are right. Um, in Secretary Tillerson's time, in the first year and a half, of the administration, uh, they tried to cut the budget by 31%. State Department is 8,500 diplomats around the world, staffing 288 embassies and consulates, and we do everything under the sun 
we, we issue the visas for people to come into this country, immigrant visas, non-immigrant visas. We interview refugees. We help American uh, citizens in distress, and there are a lot of them, unfortunately, who need our services. On the policy side, we negotiate the peace agreements for the United States. We help American companies export. And the one thing I learned in my career, we work hand in glove with the United States military. I think we can't succeed unless we're working well. I'm, I'm for fully funding the Defense Department. I wouldn't cut a penny off the $750 billion we're spending if you include the two wars. But if you're spending $750 on defense, we're spending $56 billion on the State Department and USAID and all U.S. foreign assistance a 31% budget cut in 2017 or 21% this year, it's catastrophic. And luckily, the Congress operating together, Republicans and Democrats over the last two years have restored the funding because I think they do understand you need diplomats to go along with the military and the intelligence services. But what happened in the Trump administration is that a lot of our senior people were either fired or they just resigned in protest because of these budget cuts and because of the inattention. And I really hope, I think the President has a chance here. Um, with, a, with a Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, who believes in the department, he, he's, he's a military guy, he had your job as CIA director, he understands the need for this to succeed, and I'm hopeful maybe they'll see a, a, a turnaround in the next year or two. Bill, uh, talking about the, uh, the Defense Department and uh, our military preparedness, I mean, we are spending now $716 billion uh, on defense. Uh, my question is, we've, we've run into a different kind of warfare. I mean, we, we, we used to kind of focus on, uh, you know, the wars of the past. But we're now dealing with something called hybrid war, uh, in which uh, the Russians are a good example of that, having used cyber, uh, having uh, deployed personnel uh, without uniforms to the Ukraine to destabilize the Ukraine. Uh, and, and the reality is that doing what they've done without bringing tanks or, you know, fighter planes or bombers, they've actually been pretty successful at destabilizing uh, these countries. Uh, recognizing this new kind of warfare, is the United States prepared to deal with that kind of a new battlefield in the future? But I think we're absolutely prepared to deal with it. I mean, we've looked at asymmetric warfare for a very long time. Uh, and when we think about asymmetric warfare, we think exactly about what the Russians are doing, that you have folks that are not in uniform, that folks that are using cyber, that there are different ways that they come at us on the battlefield, and are we uh, man-trained and equipped to deal with that? And I would tell you that I think we are. I think the bigger issue here is, is almost a strategic one, which is, as you know from your, your time at, at Defense, sir, the military sits down and they, they decide you know, how they're, or they recommend to Congress, how are we going to frame the military? What is the military going to look like in the future? And normally when you do that, you look at kind of two approaches. We're going to build a military that addresses the threat, or we're going to build a military that has capabilities. So when you, when you think back in the 80s in the Cold War, we were building a military to go against the Soviet Union. It was bomber versus bomber, submarine versus submarine. That is the way we built the military. And then also the wall falls and we have this large military that is equipped to deal with major theater wars, but doesn't know how to deal with counterterrorism except for a sm very small group called special operations. And then all of a sudden the military, as great as it is, swings, figures out how to you know, reorient itself, and then goes to war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, but I think as we begin to look at the military writ large, we always have to figure out from our standpoint, how do we ensure that we have a military that has the flexibility, the capability and the flexibility to adjust to whatever may come our way? recognizing that we might have to fight a major theater war. That means big armies, big navies, big air forces, big Marine Corps. But at the same time, we may have to be dealing with Russians in Ukraine. And do we have the flexibility and the capability to do that? And I think the military is pretty good about thinking through those tough issues and recommending to the Congress the right force for that, Congress and the President. John, uh, it's an issue that's uh, in the headlines, but uh, and, and uh, you've had some experience with it. Uh, in, in all the jobs you've had, which is the whole issue of immigration. Uh, after two years, uh, you know, of, of the administration, uh, making immigration obviously a big issue, uh, it would really appear that the situation at the border is worse than ever. Uh, over 100,000 apprehensions in March, 
Uh, DHS uh, seems overwhelmed and stretched. We now don't have a secretary at uh, DHS. We've lost a lot of other positions there. Uh, the president has been threatening to send uh, immigrants to sanctuary cities and told the Border, border Patrol officials that if, if they violate the law, he'll, power, he'll pardon them. Uh, is the situation at the border out of control, and what needs to be done to fix it? Well, I'd start by saying my, my last uh, duty assignment before I retired from the Marine Corps, I was the uh, commanding uh, general of uh, United States Southern Command, which has responsibilities for the Caribbean and, and all of Latin America. And so I have, I'm, I'm actually very sympathetic. As I, as I was in the South looking North, I became very sympathetic uh, to the conditions in the countries that uh, most of our, uh, the illegal migrants come from. Uh, and and I'm, I say I'm sympathetic because much of what their problems are in terms of violence and, and, and the like come as a direct result of our uh, drug use in the United States. And, and it fuels the violence in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the conditions that so many of these people are trying to uh, escape. Uh, I also am very sympathetic to the people that want, that want to come up here and escape that violence uh, because the economic opportunity is not there. And uh, I would tell you, and I know this to be a fact, they're overwhelmingly, not, uh, they're overwhelmingly good folks uh, that just want a better life. Um, and they're not all criminals and all MS-13s and the like. Uh, so that was my position, and I learned that position when I was in, on active duty. Uh, taking over at DHS, uh, the condition on the border, I mean, we do have laws that have to be enforced. And remember, as, and I'm very proud of this, I mean, we are a nation of, of, of immigrants. This country takes in 1.1 million legal, res, legal immigrants every year, uh, and those 1.1 million people are set on a course to become citizens of our great country if that's what they want. So the legal immigration is needed and is vibrant and will continue. The, the illegal immigration along the border uh, is, you know, there's laws that have to be enforced. One of the, you know, the biggest critics of the administration, of course, are the Congress, but, but they created the laws, the laws that are on the books that, that uh, people like me, law enforcement people, were, were sworn to uphold. I mean, it's illegal for me to ignore the law. And so in my time at DHS and certainly my time at, at uh, at, uh, at the White House was to appeal to the Congress to change the, the loopholes in some of these laws that would in effect deter um, the, uh, the large numbers of people who are coming up here. First issue and the second issue, and again, I go back to my time in uniform, I worked very, very, very hard both in uniform and at the White House to try to get not foreign aid, but to get uh, uh, investment in those countries because they're hardworking folks they generally don't want to leave their countries. That's where their homes are. That's where their families are. So the solution is uh, certainly multifaceted, but in my view, it starts with our, our, you know, doing something about our demand for, for drugs. It, it, it also includes uh, a minimal amount. I mean, there's small economies, a, 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 you know, small investments go a long way. Uh, and at the same time, to change some of the loophole laws, because if you change the loophole laws, uh, they'd stop coming because the, uh, the, the knowledge now is if you can get into the United States, you can essentially disappear and, and live here. John, I, you know, we, I mean, I, those of us, uh, there are a few left who worked on immigration reform in the 80s, uh, which was a bipartisan bill. Republicans, Democrats worked to pass uh, comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, and everybody, I think, today, whether it's the president or whether it's Democrats or the Republicans on Capitol Hill, everybody agrees comprehensive immigration reform needs to happen. Mm -hmm. So why the hell isn't it happening? Well, I mean, I, you know, were you ever close to no, I, developing an immigration yeah. bill, you know, that might, might include the Dreamers along with... A absolutely. The other I mean, we were very close on the Dreamers. It broke my heart. We were very close on the Dreamers. Uh, and the Congress walked away from it because the pressure, the court got involved, relieved the pressure on the Congress. We were very close on the Dreamers to include a path to citizenship, mm -hmm. which to this day I, I am still uh, stunned that, uh, that the POTUS went along with that. But he did. So we were that close. The comprehensive uh, bill 
my pitch to Congress was, look, if you don't want to pass the comprehensive bill, which they don't seem to be able to pass, let's start taking individual and have individual passages so that at least we can start to take care of some of the issues. Uh, but, uh, you know, Congress, uh, you know, Mr. Secretary, you would not recognize Washington, D.C. today from your time. No one wants to work together. If they, if I recognize they, one of the members. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, they work, if they work together, one side thinks it's a sellout, the other side, side uh, sees given in to the, you know, the, the president's desires. Yeah. We've got we've to somehow fix it. It's not working. Nick, do you have any comments on the immigration policies? Just that I think um, I, I support what General Kelly said about legal immigration. From a demographic standpoint, the United States is the second youngest of all the biggest economies in the world. And that gives us an incredible economic advantage. Younger population, more people in the workforce to pay for the older people who are in retirement. So it's India and the United States that are young societies, and Russia, China, Japan, South Korea, and all of Europe are aging. So immigration is a matter of self-interest, but as the general said, we're all immigrants. Everybody in this room has an immigrant story, and so it's part of the fabric. It's a smart thing to do. It's the right thing to do. The only other thing I'll add is that there are 68 million refugees in the world today, refugees and internally displaced people. It's the greatest number since 1945. And President um, Obama had us taking in about 70,000 refugees a year. They tend to be very young. They tend to come in families. They tend to be small business creators. And it's interesting, I think all of us would probably recognize this, when I began to swear in our younger officers in the American Foreign Service, there were refugees. There were children of refugees. I mean, they're strivers. They get into this country and they want to succeed. And so keeping the, the doors open for legal immigration and legal refugee admittance, because we know everything about these people when we let them into the country, very important for the strength of the United States. Talking about uh, Latin America, uh, let me ask about Venezuela as long as we're on the subject. Um, obviously, it's another country that's uh, in trouble. Um, and I, I think uh, many agreed with the president to try to move Maduro out uh, and try to replace him with uh, uh, Guaido. Uh, but now we've had the Russians uh, introducing personnel uh, into Venezuela. Uh, Maduro is supported by Iran, by China, by Cuba, uh, and nothing seems to be happening right now. Uh, has, has the policy failed, or where do we go from here on, on Maduro? Well, I think the policy is still playing out, so it's not failed. Um, I would tell you, uh, Mr. Secretary, that the, uh, the countries in Latin America are overwhelmingly positive towards the United States. I mean, Nicaragua, not so much. Cuba, for sure not. Venezuela, not. But um, they're, uh, they've joined together shoulder to shoulder with us. Uh, there's no, they certainly would not uh, uh, sign up to any type of military intervention. Uh, Colombia is doing great things in terms of attempting to relieve the, uh, they're taking in vast numbers of uh, refugees. Uh, housing them, taking care of them in country, uh, doing it to a large degree at their own expense. Uh, they're ready to act as is Brazil and many of the other countries. And so my view, certainly my argument would be let them handle it. And, and I think the, the policy itself is playing out. I don't, he, he doesn't want to leave. Maduro. Maduro. Um, it'd be great if someone like Cuba would offer him a nice place on the ocean for the rest of his life. And, and <laughs> And I, we could find an airplane to fly him out. Um, but in the meantime, I think it's, it's playing out. And, uh, but those people are suffering. I mean, you know, it's a humanitarian crisis. And uh, you know, Maduro and, and his henchmen don't seem to care. But uh, the good news is Latin America today is overwhelmingly democratic, overwhelmingly uh, prosperous. They have uh, vastly improved human rights records from even just a few years ago and they want to be associated with the United States as equals, and that's the best way to play this, I think. Bill, uh, let's talk about uh, the uh, threat from uh, terrorism. You've you spent your life uh, fighting uh, terrorism, uh, certainly uh, with the special forces and the role that they played. Uh, the president uh, made the statement that we've defeated uh, ISIS and 
Uh, clearly, we did push them out of the caliphate uh, in Syria and Iraq. But intelligence uh, assessments basically say that ISIS remains a threat uh, and that ISIS still commands thousands of fighters in Iraq and Syria, maintains eight branches, a dozen networks, and thousands of dispersed supporters. Uh, what is your view of ISIS as a threat to the United States, and what is the role of special forces in dealing with them? Yeah, well, first, uh, you know, you do have to give uh, a lot of credit to President Trump and the pressure that he put on ISIS it actually began in the Obama administration uh, and then continued on with President Trump, but I would tell you, I think he doubled down on it in a good way. Uh, really allowed the military, along with our, our Kurdish allies and our State Department colleagues and our intelligence community colleagues, to get out there and defeat ISIS. And the Iraqis did a marvelous job in Iraq, pushing them back into Syria. We go into Iraq, uh, take them out of Iraq, and begin to slowly uh, take away their territory to the point where they really have no territory left. But ISIS, a lot like Al Qaeda, a lot like a lot of these other movements, is partially an ideology. Now, you have to have fighters in order to implement the, the attacks they want to, but, it, but at the end of the day, it, it is about people believing in whatever the caliphate might be. So you may be able to take away all the territory, but if that ideology is still out there, and it will be, and it may not be ISIS, there may be some other branding. Remember, ISIS started out as Al Qaeda in Iraq and then morphed into ISIS. It'll morph into something else. I guess what I'd leave you with is that this fight against terrorism is a generational fight. It's not going to go away for a long time. So uh, I can tell you within the special operations community over the last couple of years, you know, we have lost 50 or 60 soldiers uh, in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Yemen, uh, and other places around the world fighting the global war on terrorism. Those, those soldiers left behind over 100 children. So anybody that thinks the, the fight against terrorism is over or, or going down is mistaken. It isn't. Uh, now, the good news is we are the most capable military, I would tell you, in the history of militaries. In the history of the world, I think we have the finest military in the world. And we certainly have the finest special operations forces. Uh, they know how to fight uh, the terrorists that are out there. But the fact of the matter is uh, this is a, a long fight. Uh, we're going to need our allies. We're going to need our allies in NATO. We're going to need our allies in the Middle East. Uh, we're going to need our allies in Asia. Um, and a lot of folks say, well, you just can't keep fighting this fight. Uh, you know, we can't be the policemen of the world. Well, the hell we can't. Uh, yeah, we can. We, we're going to have to. Because at the end of the day, they're going to keep coming at us. And, and you know, it, it's, they, they will come at us in Europe. They will come at us in Asia. They will continue to come at us. So we've got to continue to put our, I think, our you know, foot on the gas pedal and continue to drive this. Does that mean that more young Americans will die? Unfortunately, I think it does. And does it mean we'll spend billions more uh, to fight this scourge? It does. Uh, it is, is it a fight worth fighting? It is. Because we don't want another 9-11. Uh, we don't want to see what happened in Paris come to L.A. or Monterey or anywhere else. Uh, so I think we need to continue to fight this, and we've got the right forces to do it. Uh, let me... Uh... Let me ask you, uh, and it's something I've been wanting to ask you for a long time. I don't think I ever did. Uh, Bill, as I said, uh, ran the operation uh, with the SEALs that went after bin Laden. Uh, and he was located in Afghanistan, and I was at CIA headquarters, and we were communicating with each other. Uh, what worried you the most about that operation? You're asking me now? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a lot more comfortable yeah, now. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I was never really worried whether or not the guys could do the mission. Uh, I knew the guys well. Uh, you know, we had, as you well know, Mr. Secretary, we had planned this down. We had plan A, plan B, plan C, and plan D. What I didn't know, of course, were the unknowns, which was, was the compound rigged with demolition? So if you thought about the, think about these young men that were going into this situation, 24 of them on the ground, um, our concern, because we couldn't confirm it, was, was, was the entire compound rigged with demolition. We saw this a lot in Iraq, we saw it a lot in Afghanistan, and was bin Laden wearing a suicide vest? So you think about those, the, the two SEALs that came up on the, the third deck, 
they see bin Laden, they realize they've got a mission to do, they move into that room, and there he is standing, two girls are pushed in front of the first guy coming through, he thinks they have suicide vests on, he moves them out of the way, thinking he's gonna save his buddy, uh, because he doesn't know whether or not these, these young ladies got suicide vests on, and then bin Laden's there and you don't know whether he has a suicide vest. So it really was the unknown of what was actually inside the compound. All the knowns, the Pakistani defenses, whether my guys could do the job, whether we had the right plans, all that I was okay with. It was the unknowns of what was going on inside the compound and was, that, was there a potential for that entire compound to explode when 24 guys were in there. That was the, the part that worried me the most. Yeah, and I, I think I, I remember you talking about that. Yes, sir. At the time. Uh, and, and let me just ask you, on the, the backup helicopters uh, with the Chinooks, was that just part of your standard operation? It, it was. Again, we, we had two backup helicopters um, because, frankly, the, uh, the helicopter pilot, we talked about him earlier today, great warrant officer who was flying the Black Hawk that went down, he and I had had a number of discussions about the fact that as, as that helicopter was coming in, uh, there was the potential that somebody could come out of the third floor with a rocket-propelled grenade or begin to engage the helicopter. Now, we had, we had snipers and we had gunners on the door. But he told me, sir, unless I am shot dead right at that moment, I will be able to get that helicopter from there safely into the animal pen, which was the area next to it. I'll be able to get the guys down on the ground safely. And, of course, as I was watching on screen, and as you mentioned earlier today, the, the heat and the, the prop, actually, the, the blast from the prop created a vortex over the top of the helo. It lost lift, and he careened into the, uh, into the animal pen successfully as the guys moved out. Um, but we knew that was a possibility. So, frankly, we had a backup helicopter prepared just in case. And then I had a backup to the backup because we were also potentially going to have to refuel. So um, when the helicopter went down, one, I knew right away it wasn't a crash. Uh, I've crashed a lot of helicopters, um, and so uh, I knew this was just a hard landing, and of course I was listening on the radio and watching, and, and the guys were moving quickly after that. Um, but yes, sir, we had, to, we had enough backup plans to, to be able to handle that. Uh, you know, I think uh, the bravery of uh, the SEAL team, plus all of the intelligence, this was a great example of the intelligence community working with the military community on a mission. Uh, and, um, you know, when I remember at the White House after the president made the announcement, uh, walking out uh, of the uh, White House after that announcement, and there were crowds uh, gathered in both Lafayette Park and on the south side of the White House, and they were yelling, USA, USA, CIA, CIA, <laughs> which I never thought I never. would hear. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I think, uh, we were really proud because you did send a message to the world that nobody attacks the United States and gets away with it. Well, thanks, sir. Thank you for it. So, if I can just add, if I can just add one point to that, um, yeah, I will tell you, we we were uh, honored uh, to be the force that got Bin Laden. But make no mistake about it, this was hundreds of thousands of soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines great civilians, great intel community and law enforcement folks that got us to that point. Uh, this was not about one raid in Abbottabad. This was about the global war on terrorism. And when I talk about those helicopters we lost, we lost a lot of brave men when those helicopters went down uh, in both Turbine 3-3 and Extortion 1-7 that I remember personally. The number of helicopters we lost in Iraq and Afghanistan, it's a, an incredibly tragic event when that happens. You never forget those guys. Well, let's, uh, we're at the halfway point here, and we're going to turn to the questions from uh, you, the audience. But again, I'd like to take a moment, if I could, to recognize our question review team. These are the people who help select the questions that will be presented to our speakers. So I'd ask you to hold your applause until I introduce the whole group. Uh, Kate Samini, who is a reporter with the Salinas Californian. David Kellogg, managing editor in the Monterey Herald. Doug McKnight, who's a reporter with KAZU Radio. Paul Miller, who is publisher of the Carmel Pinecone, and Bradley Zeeb, who is the founding editor and CEO of the Monterey County Weekly. If you would thank them, please. We also uh, have a great group of students representing those who attended the afternoon student program, great uh, afternoon program. 
Uh, at this time, I'd like all of the students in the uh, audience to please stand and remain standing until I identify all of the schools that you represent. There are 10 schools represented this evening. They are Cabrillo College, Gavilan College, Learning for Life Charter School, Middlebury Institute of International Studies, the Monterey County Office of Education, the Alternative Education Program, Monterey Peninsula College, Navy Postgraduate School, San Jose State University, Santa Clara University, and the University of California at Santa Cruz. Great to have you. Uh, the student program, we had a great, great turnout, and I think uh, everybody here will agree some of the great questions that uh, these students asked were, were really uh, right on point. The student program is possible because of the generous support of our uh, lecture series sponsors, uh, and Sylvia and I and the Panetta Institute Board of, of Directors really are very grateful for the sponsorship that allows these students from high schools and colleges, universities, our military installations from throughout the Central Coast to participate. So if you would please give the sponsors a hand, I would appreciate that. All right, let's turn to uh, the questions from the audience. Uh, what steps should the USA take to ensure US elections uh, are safe uh, and credible from interference from foreign nations? What, what's being, what steps are being taken, and do you worry about uh, the, the Russians and the Chinese trying to interfere in future elections? Nick? We should definitely worry that the Russians and the Chinese and maybe the Iranians and North Koreans, they all have cyber capacity, could try to infiltrate our elections. We know the Russians did. Our intelligence community is, has a consensus on that in 2016. And we know they're going to try again because at least I don't believe that we've mounted a sufficient defense. And so it's a question of the federal government working with the 50 states, the electoral commissions in the 50 states to raise our defenses. It's even broader than the United States because in 2017, there's a lot of evidence that the Russians infiltrated the Dutch, French, and German elections. Putin's objectives are to cut the United States down to size. He can no longer contend with the United States military. We're stronger in every conventional sense. So he's turned to these asymmetric means that Adam McRaven talked about, and one of them is weakening our democracy, making us doubt the efficacy of our elections, making us wonder if every vote's been counted, flooding Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, social media with millions of bits of false information to turn us against each other in a fract at a fractious time. And so um, our, our federal government can't do everything, but it, can, it has a capacity to coordinate the states and to help the states raise their defenses. And as I said to the students uh, in our earlier program, I'm no longer in government, but I assume our government's doing everything we can to hit back in the cyber war as well, because I think that's the only language that Putin understands. He's 20 years in power. He's very self-confident, uh, and he's got a lot of sophistication. When he gets hit, then he'll understand there's a price to pay for doing what he's trying to do to us. John. Um, when, you, when you think about the, this issue against our country, it's just like military threat or defense of the nation. You have the away game, uh, as I characterize it, fought by the Department of Defense, CIA, people like that overseas, and you have the home game, just as important, maybe, maybe more important these days. Uh, and within uh, the uh, Department of Homeland Security, you don't hear about it very much, but they are tasked to, pr to protect all government uh, networks inside the United States, and anyone that wants to voluntarily be part of it uh, to help protect, whether it's Microsoft, and, and it, it is an amazing collaboration that DHS does in fact have with uh, companies large and small. Obviously, obviously the .gov uh, uh, networks are, are their task to pr protect, but the, uh, the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, it started a bit when I was there, but Secretary Nielsen, uh, in, in her kind of day job, you know her more from the immigration issues, but she was out and about and managed to get the into all of the 50 state states signed up to cooperate voluntarily to, to let DHS help 
protect their nets. The good news is about our, about our uh, election process, it's so decentralized. Uh, every state, not the federal government, every state runs their own, and in fact, in many cases, counties run their own, and in, and in many cases, cities. So it's a very, very decentralized, uh, so hard to attack from a cyber point of view. Not impossible, but hard to attack. I think that the larger threat, as Nick points out, is just the massive amounts of, of uh, disinformation that comes through all of these various social media. And, and I think, you know, what I learned about uh, when there were only newspapers and TV, people would say, don't believe everything you read in a newspaper or uh, watch on TV. I think that is, in spades, you should take that advice about, uh, uh, about internet and social media. Uh, because that's where I think yeah. uh, that they'll, they'll focus on to try to convince people that uh, this, this election was tampered with or this uh, individual candidate has got some baggage or whatever. So I think you right. just, as citizens, we have to redouble, triple, quadruple our efforts to really get to know the issues. Uh, an informed citizenry cannot be duped, and I think that's, we have to work harder at it. Uh, question on uh, alliances. Uh, obviously, uh, the NATO alliance uh, was a strong alliance for the United States uh, in dealing with Russia, but there are a number of flashpoints in the, in the world that uh, will demand other alliances as well. What do you, what do you believe is the future of uh, the United States in developing alliances that we need for our national security? Nick? Well, NATO's been successful, and it's not just yesterday's story, it's tomorrow's story, because they were with us in the coalition against the Islamic State Caliphate, they've been with us in Afghanistan, and they're with us in containing Putin. We have our East Asian allies, critical for the biggest challenge we're gonna face, especially the students here, and that is how do we, how do we work with China and yet not be dominated by China? Japan, South Korea, and Australia are treaty allies of the United States. The Philippines and Thailand are defense partners. India, I think it's one of the best things we've done on a bipartisan basis. President Bush, President Clinton, President Bush, President Obama, President Trump have all tried to build a big relationship with India. India is the world's largest democracy. It has the same problem with China that we do. So that's coalition building. And I think we're pretty good at this. I mean, as you served presidents, we all have. Our presidents are coalition builders, sometimes with these permanent alliances, sometimes creating temporary coalitions, and, and we have, because of our strength, and because people believe in us, we have the capacity to create those coalitions. We should never want to work alone, and as I told the students today on 9-11 when we were hit very hard, I was at NATO, uh, the Allies came to us and said we want to invoke Article 5, an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. The next morning we did, and when I called the National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice to receive the President's permission, that we would initiate this because it was going to war together. She said to me, and I'll never forget it, she said, it's good to have friends in the world. And that was your opening, Mr. Secretary, your opening comment tonight. We don't want to live alone. We're not alone. We have this tremendous attractiveness to the rest of the world because we're a democracy and we're fair-minded and we should play on that strength. Let me, uh, let me ask uh, my, our military guys here. Uh, NATO was... Uh, a very important alliance both in Iraq and Afghanistan. What was it like fighting alongside our allies? I mean, was it, was it effective? Was it tough? I mean, what? Oh, it was fabulous. Uh, I will tell you they are great soldiers. Uh, the NATO alliance, and I, I ran the NATO Special Operations Force, and then when I was in Afghanistan, I had the NATO soldiers working with me there. Uh, they were just as committed, just as brave, just as courageous, uh, and sacrificed proportionally almost as much when you take a look at the losses, certainly in Afghanistan. Um, their cultures were fun because when you're working in a group, it's almost like the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps times 10. Because, <laughs> you, you know, I think we had maybe 19 nations somewhere. In that, and again, that was not just NATO, but it was the Australians and the Swedes and, and friends of NATO. Uh, but I'll go back to something Nick said. They, they came to help us in Afghanistan, I would contend, not because of a piece of paper that said Article 5, 
they came because we helped build, rebuild Europe. Uh, we helped rebuild Japan after World War II. We have great friends around the world because of American leadership and American values. Uh, and I tell you, our future uh, won't matter so much about the, the alliances on paper. It will, it will matter about the friendships we develop president to president and citizen to citizen across the world. Because if you think what happens in a mud hut in Yemen doesn't affect the farmers in Iowa, you're mistaken. If you think what happens in Syria doesn't bother the people in California, you're mistaken. The world is so connected today, we can't get away from those problems. We shouldn't try to get away from those problems, but the only way we're going to be able to deal with them is to have friends and allies in the region that can help us. John. Thank you. General Kelly, did you have reservations about who received security clearance? <laughs> <laughs> yes, John, did you? <laughs> uh, I would just, yes. Uh, <laughs> I would just, let me just put it this way. Um, when you come out of particularly the military or the, um, or the, or the intelligence community, uh, security clearances, the handling of classified material, it's, it's a religion. It's, it's in your DNA. Uh, and every single person understands, you know, what the clearance is, how to handle classified material. Um, I would just say that uh, when, when a new team comes into the White House, and remember, on the 19th of January, the day before inauguration, the people that are working at the White House, in this case, the Obama administration, had been there two, three, four, five years doing their job. The next day, they didn't come to work. No one did. And then on the 21st, uh, the day after the inauguration, the, the new group, in this case, the Trump team, gets there. And it's a, the, the good news is there's an awful lot of, you know, career people that work at the White House. These are really, you know, very, very capable career servants that are there administration after administration. But the point is that um, the new team just didn't have the same sense of how important clearances was and that kind of thing. So when I got there, uh, and you probably read about it, I, I, I started to tighten it up. There, there were no really bad people in this. It was just that in many cases they just didn't know. It, again, it's a religion with me. It wasn't with them. And we tightened it up. And some people we had to uh, drop them down in the security clearance from, from one level to another. Uh, to until their their background investigations were complete, uh, we looked at how you know you're not supposed to have a high clearance if you don't need it. So we we permanently reduced people that simply didn't need a very very high level, uh, and then we we trained everyone in terms of how to handle and protect classified materials. So yes, I had, but uh, we fixed it, and um, it's uh, much better for the effort. All right, uh, North Korea. Uh, We've been through two summits uh, between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. Uh, there is now talk of a third summit. And yet, uh, our intelligence assessment is that North Korea will not give up their nuclear arms because it threatens their regime. What good is having another summit if it isn't going to produce denuclearization? Nick? Um, I would not advise a third summit. I, as I said before, I think President Trump was right to go to Singapore and Hanoi to take the measure of Kim Jong-un. We've learned a lot about him, but he's not given up anything. And he, he's not testing his nuclear weapons, which is positive. He hasn't succeeded in developing an ICBM that can hit, um, that, can, that can reach the atmosphere and, and reentry to hit California or Florida or Massachusetts, thank goodness. And that should be our central concern. But he's going to hold on to those nuclear weapons. And we have not created a negotiation where there's enough pressure on him right now to induce him to give up anything else. So our two weapons, our two points of leverage were these guys. It was the ability to say, if you don't cooperate with us, we have military options, although the options were very difficult. And we talked about that today. The second was more important, economic sanctions. We had China, Japan. South Korea, India, the European Union, Russia, and the United States all sanctioning North Korea. I think that's what drove him to the, Kim to the negotiating table last year. But when the president came back from Singapore, the president announced by tweet 
from Air Force One on the ground in Washington. The North Korean nuclear problem has been resolved. It hadn't been resolved. What's happened since? China and Russia have started trading again. South Korea wants to make peace. So the sanctions have, have, have been diminished. There's no pressure. I think it would be a waste of the president's credibility. You don't want to see our president fail. We should want President Trump to succeed here. I'd send in some of the more, not junior people, but our ambassadorial level negotiators. We have a very good person named Steve Began. The general knows him well. He's hard-nosed. I'd let uh, Steve and Secretary Pompeo take the lead from here. Okay, let's, uh, interesting question here. How is climate change impacting military decisions and deployment currently? How will the military prepare for dealing with escalating climate-based crises uh, with an administration that has publicly uh, denounced uh, and stated that climate change is not real? Bill? Well, what I do know is that, uh, again, we talked about the military planning process, and uh, I will tell you, a couple times a year, uh, when I was uh, part of the senior leader conference with uh, General Kelly, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, we, we would go down to Quantico, and we would get in the gymnasium, and we would lay out uh, all the orders of battle, and we would, we would war game our strategy as we began to build the budget uh, to make recommendations to the President and the Congress on the shape of the military to come. Uh, the military today, as they think about uh, how, what issues are going to affect the development of the military, certainly think about climate change. They realize that climate change is affecting everything from natural disasters, which means that the military will have to be pulled away in order to uh, support natural disasters. They know that the rising sea levels will, at, at some point in time, affect freedom of navigation in certain areas. They understand that the, the melting ice caps mean that the Russians will have more access to the Arctic. So all of these things come into the thought process that the military puts into uh, their, their overall military strategy. So uh, it kind of, it, I won't say irrespective of whatever the, the administration's position is, but the military knows they have to think about these issues in order to build the, the best military to propose to the President and the Congress. I just, uh, just really a quick vignette about the planning, the way the military plans. I mean, it's a culture of planning. I can remember when I worked for Secretary Panetta in the first few, few weeks I worked for him, almost every day there'd be some crisis on TV and, in uh, the pre and I'd bring someone up from the joint staff, uh, usually a one star, two star, and I wanted them to get to meet the, the secretary as well. Uh, and they'd come up and give him a quick thumbnail uh, uh, brief on whatever the issue was. And of course, they always referenced the plan that uh, we had for just such an eventuality. And I mean, this was every day. So after uh, a very short period of time, um, the, pres uh, the, the secretary said, you know, Kelly, do, what, what, you know, do we have a plan for like, I mean, is that all they do down there is plan? Is there a plan for everything? I said, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, it's a culture. Uh, they look at every conceivable problem before it's a problem and, and develop a plan to address the problem. Something in the can, ready to go. I said, there is actually a plan if South Carolina invades uh, North Dakota. I mean, we got a plan, <laughs> really? We got a plan for everything. And, uh, and that's a good thing because they, the, the military and the military staffs don't wait to be told what to do. Uh, the combatant commanders know their zone so well. Uh, they're so deep and so broad and they're developing their own plans and feeding those plans up to Washington. So when something does happen, almost every time you pull a, a uh, probably a 70% a solution off the shelf, fill in the blanks and there's a plan and not just a war fighting plan. It could be response to natural disasters, you know, this kind of thing, so. Uh, South Carolina is not planning <laughs> on, as far as we what if they do? <laughs> <laughs> but there's a plan. Uh, John Kelly, uh, what are your concerns about President Trump appointing secretaries on an acting basis? Uh, you know, uh, First of all, the, the way it's supposed to work, the way it does work, is uh, the Senate um, is supposed to get a crack at every person that's going to be in a Senate-confirmed position, which is a lot of people. And it's the advice and consent issue, and it's part of the Constitution, and part of our laws, and the part of the way we do business. And so when you propose someone to be the Secretary of Defense, Homeland Security, whatever, uh, they have to go up before Congress, they're vetted, 
uh, background investigations completed, and then they go up and uh, have a hearing and uh, basically get uh, grilled by the Congress, both sides of the aisle, of course, uh, and then there's a vote, and typically, in my case, actually, it was 88, uh, 88 votes, yes. I mean, you don't hear that anymore because of the, uh, the, the temperature in, in Washington. Almost all the votes now are, are on, 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 uh, on uh, you know, kind of uh, political basis. But the point is, if you have an acting, um, the institution, let's talk about the Department of Defense for a second, or for that matter, DHS. When there's an acting, everyone in the organization knows that person's temporary. By law, that person can't stay in the job indefinitely, by law. So eventually, someone has to be uh, nominated. It might be that acting person. But in the meantime, the institution that they're in charge of kind of, it doesn't go, it, it coasts a little bit because everyone knows, the bureaucracy knows that that person is only gonna be there temporarily. And uh, the next person who is actually confirmed may or may not agree with the work. So it, it just kind of is, is complicating for the, for the professionals that work in the, inside the organization. And then the Congress, the Senate in particular, they want their shot at, at a person. And it's supposed to be that someone gets nominated, they go up for confirmation, they're voted on by the committee and then by the, of jurisdiction and, and then the entire Senate. And uh, if that's not working, that's not the way it's supposed to be. The, so, um, but we do have a lot of acting right now, and um, I think the, the president would be, I mean, if, if I was still there, certainly I would be pressing to get, uh, to get people nominated uh, and get the process done. And in the, in the Senate, and you, this is in the open press, I mean, the Senate is getting more and more uh, uh, agitated both sides of the aisle because they're, because of the, yeah, the, the fact that the confirmation, confirmation yeah. you know, they want the process to work and it should work. Yeah. Uh, Bill, uh, what happens if we withdraw our forces from Afghanistan? What is the future of that country? Well, I, I'm not optimistic, frankly, about the future of Afghanistan if we withdraw. Um, now, I, you know, right now we have uh, negotiations going on between one of our great uh, uh, diplomats, uh, Zal Khalizad, um, and, and the Taliban trying to, I think, broker a peace agreement. Uh, and then the thinking is, and we'll, we'll bring in the Afghans. My concern with the Taliban is they are an unreliable uh, partner in terms of a negotiation. Uh, we have done, as painful as it has been over the last uh, 18 years, I think we've done a lot of good things in Afghanistan. Uh, we've certainly opened up education for women. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we, we've ensured uh, the safety and security of the large cities from, from Kandahar to, to Mosul, uh, I mean, to, uh, to Kabul, to Mazar Sharif, to Herat. Um, although, candidly, the outlying areas are, are still uh, heavy Taliban. If we broker a peace with the Taliban and we come out of Afghanistan, I really do fear for the long-term survival of the, the government in Kabul. Uh, and, and more importantly, I fear for uh, the, uh, the young women uh, that are there that, again, we have put in a position to be successful, to go to school uh, under the Taliban. I think all that will go away. Uh, so I, I'm hoping we can find some other solution. If it was up to Bill McRaven, we would stay there for, for as long as it takes to, to make uh, Afghanistan viable. And I realize that that means more sacrifice and more money, um, but I think it's the right thing to do. I, I, I get concerned when uh, we spend time with an ally, whether it is the, the Kurds uh, or the Iraqis uh, or the South Vietnamese, and then we leave, and then the governments fall apart and entire lives and civilizations are changed. I think we have an obligation uh, as tough as that has been, I think we have an obligation to continue to help the Afghans as best we can. Okay, uh, uh, Nick, this is probably for one for you. Uh, is, uh, is there any hope for a Middle East peace agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians, or has any hope uh, been lost? I wish I could say there's hope. I mean, I, uh, we, I, a student asked this question this afternoon and said, will there ever be peace? We have to hope there's gonna be peace. Jimmy Carter was able to negotiate a peace between Egypt and Israel. Bill Clinton was able to bring peace to both Bosnia and Kosovo, so it can happen. But it's been 70 years, and both, um, neither side wants peace. The Palestinians are divided. 
Abu Mazen, the relatively more moderate leader of the Palestinian Authority in uh, Ramallah, is aging. A lot of charges of corruption. He doesn't get along with Hamas, which is, which doesn't, which is a violent terrorist group and doesn't want peace with Israel, wants to destroy Israel. So the Palestinians are divided. The Israelis very much divided, even with the recent re-election re of Prime Minister Netanyahu. Um, he doesn't appear to want to be the Prime Minister who agrees to establish a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza, divide Jerusalem, give the Palestinians a capital in East Jerusalem. He's very much in league politically right now with the settler movement, uh, the right-wing settler movement in the West Bank. Uh, and in the Golan Heights. And so it just isn't there. But you, I think for the United States, this is a tough choice. Because even if we think analytically there's no chance for peace in the next two years, and there really isn't, we're going to have to continue to play the arbiter, buffer, umpire role. Because what we've learned about this situation, I served out there when I was a young officer in the, Arab, in the Palestinian region, in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Left to their own devices, there will be terrorism. There'll be rocket wars. And, and nothing good's going to happen. So you need American negotiators to be working this issue so that when political change comes in both these communities, maybe you can capitalize on it. But it's a very difficult time. And I would say this. From Harry Truman to Barack Obama, all of our presidents, both parties, felt it was very important that while we're Israel's closest friend and supporter, we will support the rights of the Palestinian people for a just future. And since Bill Clinton, we support the right of the Palestinians to their own state. And President uh, Trump has not taken that position. He's entirely in the Israeli camp. Uh, he has cut off US aid to the Palestinian refugees. He has moved our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. He's declared Jerusalem to be the capital of Israel. None of our presidents had done this because you want to be an effective arbiter. And I think he's deprived us of that, of that station. Is the, uh, the two-state solution gone? Yeah. You know, I, I hope not. And what we mean by that is that all of us, since Lyndon Johnson, have believed that the land of, uh, of Israel, the land of, Pal of Palestine, historically, I should say, has to be divided between uh, the Palestinians and the Israelis. A lot of Palestinians believe that a one-state solution is the way forward. That's through the gun to overwhelm Israel and to defeat it, or by, by exceeding Israel in population, outvoting them. A lot of Israelis on the right of the political spectrum want a one-state solution. We can never deal with the Palestinians. We can triumph and unite the land of Israel without them. Both of those one-state solutions are recipes for violence. And so as Americans, I think we've got to be the party arguing for a two-state solution, and we've got to be an arbiter, and we've got to try to have links to both sides of this conflict, not just one. John, what? Uh what was it like to be a tough Marine chief of staff with a president who doesn't accept any discipline? <laughs> <laughs> it was heaven, heaven on earth. Uh, <laughs> um, it, you know, it, um, just, just a, kind of a real primer. Uh, the, the, chief, the chief of staff of any organization uh, the, the, the primary thing that person's supposed to do is obviously organize the staff. There's always a principal, whether it's a general, an admiral, or a president. And so when, when I got to the, uh, to the White House, what, and I was drafted. I mean, the president called me one day and said, I, I need you to come and be the chief of staff. I was, I was pretty happy where I was. Um, but, you know, when the president calls, just like when he asked me to be Homeland Security, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a man of serving the country. And, uh, even though I never wanted to work another day in my life after 45 years in the Marine Corps, I, I took it on. So I get to the White House, and there was, there was no process. There was no staff functioning, as, as certainly as anything uh, remotely close to what you'd see on, say, a military staff or on any staff. So the first, thing I put in, the first thing I put in place was that we would staff the president. And so for every issue that came up, whether it was a pop-up issue like you know, Syria using Assad, using chemical weapons against his people, or something more long-term like developing a uh, you know, tax reform package or something like that, uh, we got the right people in, started the process, started to put together and develop the policy, and then eventually took that to the president and had ser a series of uh, of meetings with him from, you know, very disparate. I mean, we, uh, depending on what the issue was, we had, 
We had uh, pastors of small black churches. We had evangelical leaders. Uh, we had uh, uh, always members of Congress would come. Uh, these are various, on, on various, we had uh, uh, leaders from the gay community come in. I mean, it was really a uh, industrialist union leaders on some of the issues uh, that we, we were bringing to the president. And so we just feed the president as much information as it takes so he can then make an informed decision. We made, when he'd make his decision, then people like me, I, I'm actually responsible for it, to then implement that. So you, he makes the decision, and then you get the entire government going in, in the right direction. So while I was there, he accepted uh, that process, and, um, and for the most part, uh, you know, it worked. It was, it was pretty consistent. Um, but he is, he is a man of, of, you know, like all of us, has his own, uh, you know, strong opinions on things. And, uh, but in every case that, uh, that while I was there for 18 months, in every case, we stuck to this process, and, um, and he made decisions. Uh, you, again, you may disagree with his decisions. You may dislike him personally, or maybe you voted for him. But the point is, he's the president of the United States. And if he fails or makes a mistake, it impacts every one of us, Democrat, Republican, man, woman, gay, straight. And he, as the president of the United States, deserves uh, the best servicing of his staff that uh, anyone can, can give him, and I gave him that for 18 months. It, it, you know, it, thank you. Uh, he, uh, he's intuitively a New York developer. Uh, has he been able to, to adjust from being a developer in New York to being president of the United States? Um, as a, develop, as a developer, you know, one of the things I, I uh, and I've worked with, I've been fairly close to two presidents. Now, I watched Mr. Obama when we were on active duty. And so, you know, the frustration level, I think, with, with all presidents when they come in is, and this gets to the checks and balances. And God, if, if I ever doubted why we had checks and balances, I mean, those guys that wrote the Constitution were really smart. <laughs> um, because there, there is, you know, you, uh, you know, just imagine, you're, you're, the pre you, you're the candidate, you've won, you come in and you want to make the changes that you promised the American society, the voters, you want to do that. And so you're all excited about it and you hit, you know, squarely, the first problem you have is uh, the, bureaucr the bureaucracy does not work that, it works and, the, and there's tens of thousands of really great Americans that work very hard in those bureaucracies. But there's, there's ways that the bureaucracies operate as defined by law. So quick decisions are really not possible. They are if you have a, like a 9-11 or, you know, or an attack on, on Pearl Harbor, something like that. But the rest of the way the government works is relatively slow, relatively ponderous. Uh, it appeals actually for input from, uh, from uh, the, uh, the voters. Um, so every president is frustrated when he gets into the office because um, he just doesn't have uh, the powers that maybe he thought he had. So uh, in the case of President Trump, I mean, in, in every president, uh, my role was when he wanted to do, do something to back to the process, to start the process and find out what's within the realm of the doable. Uh, and for immediate issues would be, I got to get the lawyers down here, sir. I'm not so, I don't know if you have the authority to do that, so let's get the lawyers down here. Sometimes he did have the authority and, and we'd go do it. And in other cases, you don't have the authority, you would have to go to Congress. Um, and so when you're, when you're a man of action or a woman of action someday in the, in the Oval Office yeah. uh, and you, you hit right up against this ponderous, slow checks and balances yeah. thing. Uh, you can always pardon somebody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said that. Let me, <laughs> <laughs> let, me, uh, let me ask you, I, we've got about, uh, about three minutes left. Um, I, I really want you to look at uh, you know, the time between now and uh, the next five years. And tell me whether you're optimistic or pessimistic about the future of this country. Bill? I'm optimistic. And uh, I think it surprises people when I tell them I am the biggest fan of the millennials and Gen Z that you'll ever meet. And, and part of this is, uh, you know, I, I love this kind of narrative about the millennials that 
they're entitled and they're soft and they're little snowflakes, um, then I, I tell you, you've never seen them in a firefight in Afghanistan. Uh, or you've never seen him as a firefighter here in California or a teacher or a doctor. This is a fabulous uh, group of Americans and I am convinced when they write the history of the 21st century, they will say that this was the greatest generation, these millennials. Um, so I, I think when we, again, they're, they're different than, uh, than the baby boomers were, uh, but in a good way, you know, they are more inclusive, they ask hard questions. Uh, they really take care of their friends. And, and whether you agree with their politics or not, you know, you, you look at what the kids in Parkland did as they mobilized against an issue they thought was important. Uh, I'm not sure my generation would have done that. Uh, so I, I think that there is hope because the young men and women uh, give us hope. Thank you. Uh, Nick? I'm optimistic. We've got a great country. You, you just, in this conversation, we are powerful. We can do great things in the world. We've got enormous challenges. Climate change is the biggest. Dealing with Chinese power, pushing out against us in the Pacific is another, containing Putin. Dealing with our problems here at home like inequality is going to be very important. But uh, as long as we've got good leadership, good women, good men coming into public office and leading us forward, our country can do great things, so I am optimistic. John? Optimistic. Uh, our strength is who we are. Uh, we're going through a, a process here right now, and it's temporary, it will be temporary, to where we're not getting along very well. We're not listening to each other. We're yelling at each other. Uh, there was a time not so long ago, and, uh, and I'm very confident, very close in the future, to where we can have discussions about social issues or political issues and not hate each other. Uh, but we've got to get beyond it because no one, certainly Washington is, exceptionally dysfunctional because they can't talk to each other. Yeah. The good news is about people, most people all they want to do is live their lives. They want to raise their families, uh, get a halfway decent job, spend a little time watching the Boston Red Sox when they can. <laughs> uh, we, are, we are strong if, and I am uh, optimistic. If you have any questions about being optimistic, I, I ask you to listen to these three individuals because every one of them is a great public servant and thank God that there are those who devote themselves to making our democracy strong for the future. This is our strength <laughs> for the future. Thank you all tonight.